What I wanted to share about today is that I'm sensing in the spirit, a lot of Christians are wanting what's easy, right? A lot of people, not just Christians in general, in today's society, people are wanting what's easy. They want what comes easy. I can tell you, hey, this is how you succeed. And I go, yeah, pastor, but that's not easy. I can tell you how to lose weight, but you might say, pastor, well, that's not easy. I can tell you how to have a solid relationship. Yeah, pastor, but that's not easy. And I'm confused. And when did we become so accustomed to just wanting what comes easy? Because anything worth having is going to take work. Anything worth having is going to take effort. And so when I'm telling you guys, when we're preaching and we're in this place and that still small voice is whispering, yeah, it's easier said than done, but that's just not easy. That is a lie from hell. That is an excuse from the enemy trying to get you to settle for less than what God has called you to. Amen. So we got to get to a place where we're stop, where we stop looking at all of the things that God's calling us to and dismissing them because they're not easy. If they're not easy, that's probably right where we should be. So we're in the middle of a series right now. Uh, two weeks ago, we did Dancing Like David. Last service, we did Devoted Like David. And today we're going to talk about Determined Like David. And so determination, I love the definition. Let me just read it. Determination is the firmness of purpose, resolve, and perseverance in pursuing a goal or objective despite obstacles, challenges, and adversity. Am I talking to people here who have any challenges, any kind of adversity, any kind of obstacles? Am I talking to anybody out there who might be wrestling with some things? Whether it's personal goals, whether it's spiritual goals, whether it's financial, whether it's health, physical, I don't know what that looks like, but I believe that we're all here and it's many times said that people are in a storm, they're coming out of a storm or they're heading into a storm. And the one thing that we can hold on to is that life be life in, right? Life is going to life. Life is going to life. It's going to be filled with grief and hurt and pain and unmet expectations, disappointment, discouragement. There's nothing that we can do to avoid those things. But the thing is, is that our hope isn't in this world or in our circumstances changing. Our hope is in Jesus. That is our source of joy. That is our source of peace. Jesus is our source of comfort. And so we're talking about determination. What I see in a lot of lives of Christians is that they're not determined. They have no steadfastness. They have no perseverance. They have no grit. When things don't go their way, they throw in the towel. They want to quit. They want to give up. When things, when, when the answer to a prayer, like, so help me God, if it's a no or a not yet, they crumble. It's a genie mentality where they believe that God is here to say yes and amen to everything, but not everything you pray about or ask for is good for you. And so we have no grit. We have no determination. We don't know how to pray through things or pray around things. We don't know how to fast. We don't know how to be set aside. We've lost determination. There's no focus, no firmness, no resolve, no perseverance. And my job here today is to stir the body up and to remind you guys of who you are in Jesus. Determination involves having a clear and unwavering commitment to achieving a desired outcome even in the face of difficulties or adversity. I want to tell you guys a little bit about determination. Um, we just had a baby three weeks ago. I swear, you, I promise you guys, I'm, I'm, yeah, we can clap, we can clap. It was tough. I worked really hard in the process. Um, I say we had a baby, she had a baby. I was there for moral support. Um, but uh, we'll talk about determination. And I promise I won't bring up the baby every week. Uh, but for the first six months, y'all are going to hear about the baby. All right. Because that is my life right now. She's got me wrapped around her little uh, pinky finger. But determination. All right. Y'all ever seen a baby? They are the picture of determination. When that baby wants something, her little neck, she, she's, it's bobbling. It's not straight. She's grunting. She's groaning. She's crying. She's doing the back bend, uh, like trying to get out of your arms. When she wants something, she is determined. She has steadfastness. She has grit. She has determination. No matter what obstacle me, no matter the adversity, her mom, no matter what gets in her way, that baby gets what she wants because she is determined. And in the same way, born again, sons and daughters of God, we need to take on that same kind of determination that my daughter is exhibiting in your own personal spiritual life. Amen. So I want to encourage you guys. If you who here has heard the story of David and Goliath, right? Maybe not. Maybe, 
I didn't think oh, that's not a lot of you guys have not a lot of you guys heard about the little shepherd boy who slayed a nine foot giant with a slingshot and a rock. Let's try this again. Raise your hand if you heard the story of David Goliath. And if you haven't, there's no shame. OK, because I think that's like day one of Sunday school or Bible stories and teaching. I was a heathen and I knew about David and Goliath. Right. I did not grow up in church and I knew about I was like, oh, yeah, David and Goliath. He killed a giant. But OK. So I would encourage you guys to read 1 Samuel chapter 16 and 17. Um, I read it again. And this isn't just another sermon on David and Goliath conquering the giants in front of you. We're not going to go there. Uh, but it's more of like I read this in a couple different translations and it spoke to me. It shows and reveals the determination of David. And so I'm going to give you the, the Cliff Notes version, the Carter version of it uh, real quick. And then we'll get into the actual scripture that I want to kind of dial into. So David was anointed king uh, at a young age. We'll say about 14, 15 years old. Um, there's some speculation on what the age is. It's not that important. Uh, but Samuel comes in and he asks Jesse, David's dad, he says, bring me your sons. One of these is supposed to be the king. And so he brings out the very first son, the oldest son. And in Samuel's heart, he's like, oh, this is him. That's a good looking young man. He's strong, ruddy. He's got a good jawline. You know what I mean? He's got great hair. Like, look at the tan on that guy. That must be the next king, right? And God said, no, 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 no. That ain't, that ain't him. Uh, man judges based on the outer appearance, but I look at the heart. And so the dad, Jesse, brings in his second son and his third son. Jesse had seven sons. He finally, he, he goes through the first six and Samuel's like, this is all the guys you got? Like, this is it? And he was like, well, no, there's David. He's out tending to the sheep. And if you guys don't know, tending to the sheep was probably one of the lowest jobs on the totem pole. They reserved it for the youngest brother. You know how the youngest brother's got to do all the, the, the chores that suck. Like, it was on him. And he was like, David? He was like, all right, I guess we'll go get him. So he brings him in, and immediately Samuel recognizes the spirit in him and anoints David as king. So before David ever stepped foot into the kingdom or became king, he was doubted by his own father, Right? There was resistance and opposition in this place. Shortly after, Israel's going to war with the Philistines. Goliath, the nine-foot giant, is a Philistine. And what he's doing is he's going out on the battle line, and he's standing there, and he's screaming to the Israelites and basically cursing God and the God of the Israelites and saying, if one of you men can come up here and defeat me, we'll basically surrender. But this is a nine foot guy. This isn't like Victor Wimbanyana, okay? Uh, he's not like seven six, a buck 85. Like this is Shaquille O'Neal. Um, and I'm talking like Orlando Magic Shaq when he was strong and athletic and big. And so you're thinking of like Shaquille O'Neal versus Muggsy Bogues. And I date myself because I grew up in the 90s. So Muggsy Bogues was the shortest player in basketball history at the time. He played for the Charlotte Hornets. He's a little guy versus a, a really, really big guy. And the way that the giant was talking had everybody terrified, scared, shaken in their armor. They would not go up against him. And so David is told by his dad to go bring some snacks to his brothers. His brothers, his oldest brothers are out there fighting. And um, you know how little brothers do. He wanders out there and he's looking and he's like, oh, like you guys are going to war. And he leaves the snacks and he's curious. He's like, what's going on out here? And somebody's explaining it to him. And his brother is like, bro, what are you doing? Go home. You're just out here trying to get your fill of gossip. You ain't even supposed to be out here. Go back home. Scolds him. The, the Bible says that David, like, anyway, walks over and he gets more information from somebody else. You know how little brothers are with big brothers. He's like, anyway, I'm going to go over here. So he gets more information. And it's perplexing David as a young man of God. He's saying, hold on a second. We are God's chosen. We are God's called. We are, we, we have been set aside. We are a special people, a holy nation. He was determined. He had a goal. He had a mindset. He had a direction. He was not going to be moved. And so you guys know how the story goes. Maybe you don't. I would encourage you guys to read it. First Samuel uh, 16 and 17. It's a great story. It's more than just the child uh, story that we read about, but he, he goes out there and, um, takes care of business, hits the giant with a sling and stone, cuts his head off with his own sword. What I want to talk about is found in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 48. And this stood out to me because whether you're going through some adversity, some obstacles, some issues, I don't know what it is that you're wrestling with, this encouraged me. 
So in verse 48, and I'm going to read this out of three different translations. It says, so it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David hastened and ran toward the enemy and the army to meet the Philistine. What I love about this is the determination of David. He was so convicted in who he was. He was so locked in with his identity, his calling, and his purpose that he ran toward the opposition. He ran toward the obstacle. When no man would step forward, when no man would stand on the front line, David ran toward the obstacle because David was determined. And what I'm trying to get into you guys is that no matter what obstacle, what issue, what resistance, whatever it is that you're wrestling with, when you know who you are in God, you run toward it and not from it. You don't have to back down because our God fights on our side. He will bring down the provision. He will bring down the angel armies to fight on your behalf. The Bible says that the weapons form, but they will not prosper. We have the authority and boldness to run toward the enemy, to run toward the obstacle, to run toward the adversity because we know whose God we are. We know whose we are. We know the God that we serve. The word towards means in the direction of, and I think that a lot of us, it's our natural inclination to fight, freeze, or flee. The three responses when it comes to fear. And I would go out on a limb that many of you, as you're, in, you're, you're wrestling with fear and adversity and obstacles, I think that our natural inclination is either to freeze, to stand still, and then pray to God and hope that something happens, or, or many times it's to flee, to run, to tuck tail. And there's certain times when we should flee, right? Sexual immorality, flee, <laughs> like get out of there, right? There's, a, there's times when fleeing is appropriate. There's times when we're called to freeze, to wait, to stay still, to be patient. But what I'm believing in this season that many of you are being called to fight and to move toward and to move forward, but you're in retreat mode, you're stuck, you're not moving forward and you're stuck in a rut wondering where God is. And so I want to call you guys higher when you're in the middle of the storm, when you're facing your mountains, your obstacles, the bad news, the hurt, the disappointments, the loss, the pain, I want to encourage you guys to be determined like David, know who you are and run towards the opposition. Amen? I shared this morning that a little emotional, heavy hearted, and you could probably tell I'm preaching a little bit out of that. I'm not trying to bleed on you guys. But um, I, like I said, I recognize when we're under attack, when there's opposition, when there's resistance, we're heading in the right direction. We're heading in the right direction. And I believe that what is being accomplished in this city and in this ministry and in each and every one of your lives, I believe that God is doing an amazing work. And to expect opposition. Don't be caught off guard. It shouldn't be a surprise. It wasn't a surprise. It hasn't been a surprise. A little blindsided by the intensity and the frequency, but at the, but at the same time, I know whose I am. I know what we're doing. And so I'm going to press forward and move in and go towards that. I'm going to continue in the direction God's calling me. Amen? All right. So biblical determination, right? We've defined determination. Biblical determination is grounded in faith and reliance on God's strength and provision. It's not relying on us. What I'm not doing here is trying to get you to believe in yourself. This isn't a TED talk. This isn't a self-help ministry where I'm trying to empower you and get you the tools to become more determined. You see, David was determined because David relied on God. He relied on the anointing that he got from God. He was stepping in the purpose and the calling of what God called him to. Pound for pound, you look at David versus Goliath. I'm taking Goliath nine times out of 10 if not 10 for 10, right? If I'm a betting man, I'm not, okay? Okay, I'm not, gonna, you're not gonna see me down there at the casino. But what I am saying is if I was, my money would have been on Goliath. That's just common sense. But what we don't know or understand is the power and the strength in which God has. The power and the strength in which he operates. The battle was already won. All David had to do was step into what he had already been called to. He was determined Scripture encourages us many times um, to be steadfast and immovable in our faith. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, 
knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let me put this in 2024 version. Hey, you need to stand on business. You need to be 10 toes down. You need to get dialed in. You need to get locked in. Our faith should be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that what we're doing here is not in vain. I'm reminded that if God called us to it, he's going to bring us through it. And if God called us to it, he's going to provide every step of the way. He's going to provide the people. He's going to provide the venue. He's going to provide the food. He's going to provide the drinks. He's going to provide everything, whatever it is that you need. If you have been called to it, God will bring you through it. And that's where my hope is. My hope, again, isn't in me or my own natural abilities. It's in God. And I'm encouraged and I'm reinforced and I'm immovable because where I am is I'm standing on the rock and not on the sinking sand of what this world promises us peace. The Bible also says to press on toward the goal of knowing Christ and fulfilling his calling. Philippians chapter 3 verse 14 says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We're talking about determination. We're talking about being so focused, so dialed in, so locked in, that no matter what's happening to the left or to the right or behind us, whatever's happening in the rear view or in our peripheral, we're so dialed into what God's doing that none of those things distract us. We continue to press forward. We continue to march forward. We continue onward and upward, and we go toward the noise. We go toward the darkness. We go toward the enemy. We go toward the front lines. We don't allow our circumstances to dictate our trust or our relationship with God because our circumstances will lie to us every single time. Our feelings will lie to us every single time. Our emotions will lie to us every single time. We got to press forward. We've got to go toward the goal of the prize. And what I don't ever want us to get mistaken uh, by is this isn't a prosperity gospel. What I'm not telling you is that if you guys follow the word and do these things, that your life is going to be perfect and that he's going to answer all your prayers and you're going to have all the money and you're going to have all the things. That's not what I'm saying. Because you look at the lives of the disciples, faithful men, who gave their everything. They saw the risen Jesus. I don't know about you, but would you die for a lie? Well, I wouldn't. If I knew that Jesus wasn't raised from the dead after three days, if you got me in front of a boiling pot, we're like, we're going to boil you alive. I'd be like, well, let's talk real quick because, um, <laughs> hold on a second. You're going to, you're going to cut me in half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He, we moved the body. Like if that was the case, I would, I would be telling, I'd be worse than the last four, the first 48 hours. I'd be in there snitching, tattletelling with a cigarette and a two piece. I'd, well, what had happened was the night of the burial, we got that body gone. Like we got it out of there. You're not going to just kill me for a lie. But that's not the case. The disciples died. They were buried. They were crucified. They were cut in half. They, I mean, the things that they, they, they went through was because they understood the resurrected Jesus. They knew what happened. They knew who he was. And so the goal and, and, and what I'm asking you guys to do isn't for your best life now. It's because our hope and our faith and our trust is in eternity. There's a bigger picture. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have prosperity or you can't have things while you're here in this earth or while you're here. But that's not the mission. That's not the goal at hand. It's not about followers. It's not about uh, numbers. It's not about the money in our bank account. It's not about the number of trips that we're taking. It's about souls. It's about serving. It's about loving people. Yeah. It's about preaching the gospel. Yeah. It's so much greater. That's what our hope is in. That's what drives us. That's what makes me more determined. The picture of eternity. This isn't on the screen, but I'm going to read this. i was going back and forth on whether or not to include it. We're going to. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Jesus left the blueprint. 
He said, hey, this is how we do it. This is the way that we go. His eyes were focused on something greater than what right here. He said, stop looking to the left. Stop looking to the right. Stop worrying about all of the things. And I understand that it's hard when the bills are due. It's hard when you're brokenhearted and lonely. It's hard when there's a loved one laying on their deathbed and you're praying for them to get better. I understand that life can be hard and it's not fair. But we have a savior who promises to do life with us, to never leave us, to never forsake us, to hold our hand through it all, who's gone before us, who knows, he knows what it's like to feel lost and to be abandoned and to be hurt and to be betrayed. He knows what you're going through. And my, my heart cry this morning, again, emotional. I was talking before, I was like, if you cry, I'm crying. Don't cry today. I don't get up here and cry. You, I can't even tell you how many times I've cried up here and there's nothing wrong with that but I'm emotional in the spirit because I feel that there's a heaviness on the body. I feel like there's no determination. We've lost our grit. We've lost our excitement, our power. We're not operating in the authority that God's called us to because we're so concerned about yesterday. We're so concerned about the things to the right, the things to the left that we're losing focus. And so Hebrews says to focus on what's ahead for the joy that was set before him. The joy that was set before Jesus was eternity. It was the fullness of God's plan coming into fruition and for it to come full circle. So if Jesus is hanging on the cross, is there thinking about what it means to give his life for us while we are still sinners, right? If that's what his eyes are focused on, then shouldn't ours be too? Shouldn't we be looking at the scope of eternity? Stop selling your eternal blessings for temporary comforts. For temporary comforts, none of it goes with you. I'll give you a couple more examples. I don't want to go too deep into determination, but King David, as one of the central figures of the Bible, I asked a question on Friday during coffee and prayer. Um, who would you want to have dinner with? Any biblical character outside of Jesus, because the spiritual thing to say is, oh, Jesus. No, stop. Okay. Outside of that, like who else do you want to meet with? Um, and then you got some people who are aggressive. Eve, I want to ask her why she ate the apple. And it's like, <laughs> okay, everybody take a break. It's not that deep. Why are you so angry? Forgiveness is key. Um, yeah, people, and then other people, Judas. And it's like, call, like, what are you going to say to Judas? He, like, that was a part of what it was supposed to go that way. Like, leave these guys alone. But one of the, the, the main people you hear is David. A lot of people want to talk to David because David was a man known to be a man after God's own heart. Yet, if you study the life of David, David was a wreck. All right? David's life was in shambles many of the times. And, and that resonates with me as a man because he was considered a man after God's own heart. Yet, he was wrestling with adultery. He was wrestling with murder. Uh, David was a terrible dad. His kids wanted to kill him, right? Like his life wasn't this picture perfect life of showing up every Sunday and his Sunday's best. And when everybody asked how he's doing, oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. No, David was a wreck. Read the Psalms. Some of those like his journal where he's like, I'm surrounded by enemies. The roof of my tongue is stuck to, or the, the tongue is stuck to the roof of my mouth. I feel like my bones are breaking inside of me. Like homie had some problems, but was known as a man after God's own heart. So some of the characteristics of his determination are found in his, the pursuit of God's presence. Like he was determined to seek God. Even when he was caught in adultery, he wanted to seek God. In, in his lowest moments, he was determined to, what does God say about this? What can I learn from this? How can I grow from this? He was determined to get into God's presence, and we should too. Another story of his determination is found in 2 Samuel 6, after he uh, wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. Okay. He was determined. The first time he took it was a wreck. Somebody died. They had this big parade. There was all kinds of things going on. He brings the ark just a little bit of the way. Somebody leans on it. They die. He was out of order. He wasn't doing things the way that he was supposed to. He was upset. He was discouraged. Someone died, but he goes to God, allows God to fix it. And he was determined to do it the right way. So again, a man after God's own heart who makes mistakes, but is able to learn from them. So David was determined. That's why we have this series, a flawed human man who loved the Lord. Does that sound like any of you out there? How many of you guys have made some mistakes? Raise your hand if you ever made a mistake. Yeah, some of you are perfect. I love that. That's good. Um, 
I mean, who here has been to jail? Raise your hand. No, don't raise your hand. Hey, hey, hey everybody calm down. Hey. <laughs> uh, people, your neighbor pulls their purse closer. Like, you've been where? No. I will never call you guys. Don't ever raise your hand if I ever call you guys. Don't do that. That's not good. Um, but David was a man just like you and I made a lot of mistakes. And uh, I love his determination. I love his determination. What I, <laughs> I love acronyms. Uh, if you guys were here last service, whole, right? Do you guys remember whole from last time? Uh, worship, heed, obey, linger. And what was the E? Embrace. Oh, somebody was listening. That's good. I love that. So what I believe that we need to do as believers is have more grit. Right? I've brought that word up a few times. Um, grit. 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 Let me define that for you real quick. Grit is a personality trait possessed by individuals who demonstrate passion and perseverance toward a goal despite being confronted by significant obstacles and distractions. When I think of grit, I think of athletes, right? When I think of grit, I think of stay-at-home moms, right? Because that takes some grit to raise them bad little kids running around the house. Um, when I think of, of grit, I think people uh, of people who are determined and no matter what they're going through, whatever it is that they're facing, they buckle down and they press forward. It almost sounds as if we're talking about David, who had grit. And so the biblical acronym that I've got here, G, I believe that if we do these four things, this is going to help us to live a life that is determined, a life that is moving towards, a life that is grounded in the word and is attacking whatever it is that's coming against us. Quick side note. Have you guys heard uh, the saying, the gates of hell will not prevail? Have you, have you guys heard that? What are gates typically used for? To keep people out. If I put a gate around my house, what is that for me and my kids to keep my kids in? Maybe sometimes, but for the most part, right? Because <laughs> them kids are crazy. But most of the time, it's to keep people out. So if there's gates of hell, what does that mean about hell? Hell is trying to keep you and I away from it, not the other way around. So many of us think of hell and the devil with his red pitchfork as if he's coming after us and poking us. But it says that the power in us is greater than the power in the world. Because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the authority and power that we have shakes the gates of hell. And it's not the other way around. We don't have to be afraid of, oh, the devil made me do it. Oh, the spiritual attack is coming. Spiritual warfare isn't a bad word. And it doesn't mean that you've done anything wrong on your good days. I don't care if you spend 24 hours in prayer, fasting, and reading your word. You can come out of it and still experience spiritual warfare. It's a part of what it is that we're doing here in life. You're going to be warred against. And so we get this mindset where we think, oh, I'm battling spiritual warfare. So oh, there must be something wrong with you. You must be, have a secret sin or there might be something. going. No, like you're under attack because you're valuable to the kingdom. So... The gates of hell will not prevail, meaning they won't hold up. And if we move towards the darkness, if we move towards the front line, those gates are going to fall and we're going to take dominion. We're going to take territory. We're going to take land. We're going to take what is rightfully ours as God's children, as believers. And so my goal is to stir you guys up grit. The G stands for God's guidance. I don't want to go where God hasn't called me. Amen. So like I can sit here and say, move towards it. But like, if God didn't call you to move towards it, please don't. Um, what a lot of people do is they mistake determination with stubbornness. Cause some of you guys are stubborn and you mask it and go, Oh, I'm just determined. No, you're in disobedience and you're stubborn and you're not listening to what God's called you. He's called you to stay, but you're heading straight forward. So the big part of being determined is to make sure that you're going where God is called. That's number one, because I can tell us we got to march forward, go towards the gates, but you better make sure that's what God's calling you to do. Because if he says stay, you better stay. If he says to sit, you better sit. If he says wait, then you'll wait. So the first part of this, if we want to be determined, hey, be determined to seek his guidance before anything else. Make sure that where you're going, he's calling. Acknowledge God's guidance in all endeavors. Trust in his wisdom and direction as you pursue your goals. The R resilience in faith to remain steadfast 
Stop allowing your feelings and emotions to dictate your actions. Let me say that again. Stop allowing your feelings, because so many people are moving and operating out of their feelings and emotions rather than the truth of God. They're making decisions based on temporary feelings and emotions that are here today, gone tomorrow. And if they would have stayed, if they would have waited, if they would have prayed, if they would have held their tongue, they wouldn't make the situation worse. But most people are. They're making it worse because they're not resilient in their faith. They're responding rather than reacting. As soon as something doesn't work out the way that they feel it should work out, they're responding or reacting to the situation, many times making it worse. So resilience in faith means to stay steadfast in your faith, even in the faith, even in the face of adversity. Trust God's promises and his faithfulness to sustain you through your trials. So many people give up too soon. We throw in the towel. We have no steadfast. Uh, We we have no grit. We have no, like, uh, the word, I don't even know the word I'm looking for. We're just not willing to stay and sit in it. We're comfort junkies. Like, that's what we, who here is ready to go home and take off your regular pants and put on some sweats? (laughs) <laughs> Amen. And the rest of you might not be telling the truth. I know that I want to get home. I love being in the house of the Lord, but boy, that Mexican food hits different after church and those sweatpants be sweating and man, I'm going to take a nap and it's going to be crazy. All right. So I love comfort. I get it. We're comfort junkies. That's what we desire. But so many times results happen at the end of our comfort zone. God is trying to expand you. He's trying to pull you outside of your comfort. And in those places is where he wants to use you. Integrity and character. Uh, worship team, you guys can go ahead and start making your way up. That's good news for some of y'all. You're like, oh, that means he's about to land the plane. You're like, woo, that Mexican food. Hey, don't talk about Mexican food. You ain't even done. Integrity and character, the I. Right? So God's guidance, resilience and faith, integrity and character. We have to make sure that our private life is the same as our public life and that they're not duplicit. They're not different. So many people are here putting on this face or pretending that things are a certain way when that's just not what it is. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of Christianity that's fake, that's false, that's like I come up here and I share, yo, we're going. I had a hell of a week. This week was tough. It was challenging. There was opposition and resistance, and I felt the adversary. I'm going to get in trouble later for saying hell. I guarantee you my wife's going to. She's like, you can't use it in that context. But it was hell manifested in my life. I'll justify it, right? It felt as if I was in hell. Now I'm just doing it too much, right? I was like, hey, no, no. (laughs) She's like, felt like I was in hell. But I share that to be open and honest and vulnerable with you guys to let you know that there is no picture perfect life. That Instagram picture with the filter and with the Photoshop and with all of the things in order and in place, that does not exist. Many of you were fighting on the way over here, arguing with your spouse. Some of you were out late last night, later than you should have been, probably drinking things you shouldn't have. And I'm not here to judge because you're in the right place this morning, but I want you to know that we've got to have a level of integrity. Be determined to live the same way that we're projecting out there. Because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when you will be exposed. Everything done in the dark will eventually be revealed by the light. It's only a matter of when. So we can put lipstick on the pig we can dress it up we can make it look good but it's only a matter of time if you are not walking in integrity and living a life of character it will be exposed and a part of that determination again we're asking god for guidance we're being resilient in our faith and we're living lives that are pursuing holiness and righteousness we're living in ways that we have been called to live as children of god the t is for tenacity in service. So God's guidance, resilience in faith, integrity in character, and tenacity in service. If you haven't been here, our word for the year is service. It's not a sexy word like prosperity. It's not a sexy word like money bags. Like our word is service. This year, Royal City Church is committed to serve people, to serve the lost, to serve the homeless and unhoused, to serve single mothers, to serve our community. That's what we're here for. 
And I believe that it helps in our determination. We're determined like David because David asked for God's guidance. He was resilient in his faith. Although he made mistakes, he had an integrity in his character. I told you guys this last week. If I made some of the mistakes that I made, like David did, I would have omitted them from the Bible. I would have said, ah, let's just keep that one out. But he went in and put it. Like he, he allowed for that to take place. He didn't try to wipe it out or blot it out or put white out over it. He allowed that to be there because he had an integrity. There was integrity in his character. And so tenacity and service means serve others with determination and perseverance. Emulating Christ's example of sacrificial love and servant leadership. Tenacious. I love the word tenacious. And some of you are like tenacious D, Jack Black. And it's an old comedy. Thank you. He, somebody knows who tenacious D is. I just dated myself. But the word tenacious means to keep a firm hold of something, clinging closely. Somebody who's tenacious is the kind of person who never gives up and never stops trying. If you fall down seven, you get up to eight. No matter what, you're standing on God's promises. You're holding to his truth that no matter the obstacle, the adversity, the hurt, the pain, whatever you're going through, you hold on to the truth. And you allow that to be the firm foundation and the solid rock that you build your life on. Stop giving up. Stop throwing in the towel. Let's take on that same heart posture as David and to work on being determined regardless of what it is that you're going through. Would you guys please stand with me? As we're in this place, sometimes, some of you, it might be your first time uh, some of you have been with us for some time. But if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you've never accepted him as that. I want to give you guys an opportunity to do just that. If you believe in your heart of hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord, if you believe in your heart of hearts that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody goes to the Father except for through him, if you believe that he died for your sins, that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, he died for those sins, and didn't just stay dead, but rose three days later. You believe that he rose three days later and revealed himself to the apostles and to over 500 people before he ascended into heaven. If you believe that today and you want to invite him to be the Lord of your life and the savior of your soul, would you lift your hand up today? Yes. Amen. I see him. Keep him high. Keep him high. Yes. Amen. 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 Glory to God. Welcome home. Welcome home. It's not easy. Never promised to be. But what you do have is the assurance of a Savior that loves you, that will fight for you, that will be with you, and will walk with you all the days of your life. Would you guys bow your heads with me and let's pray as we leave this place. Father God, first and foremost, we just want to thank you for those who decided to put their faith in you, God. As we welcome them home, as we welcome them back to the family, the prodigals who might have been gone, Lord, I just ask that you would embrace them. Holy Spirit, comfort them. God, even now there's brothers and sisters in this place who lack grit. They lack determination. They give up and quit easily. Lord, today I pray that that would be no longer. Holy Spirit, quicken to their mind. Holy Spirit, soften their heart. Lord, your word does not return void. And so we ask that you would plant the seeds of your truth inside of their heart so that it might bear fruit in your perfect timing. God, I pray that you would work in each and every one of my brothers and sisters. God, that you would help them to see that they're important, that their story matters. God, that service is the way. God, we ask that you would guide us that you would help us to be resilient in faith, God, that you would help us to live lives that match our private lives in public. And God, help us to, uh, to have a tenacious, tenacious attitude when it comes to serving, that you would put a, a tenacity about us. Help us to operate in the authority and the fullness of who you've called us to be. God, may your name be high and lifted up, the name of Jesus be high and lifted up. God, we thank you for this encounter. We thank you for this word. And we pray that as we enter into just a moment of worship, that we would encounter your heart, that we would know who you are. God, speak to us, even through worship, even through this message, and give us an opportunity just to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor that you are so worthy of. We pray all of this by the power of the blood and in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank and you for amen. watching. 
When you tithe, donate, and contribute, you're partnering with Royal City Church in preaching the gospel around the world. So thank you. Before you go, make sure you turn on the notifications and hit that subscribe button. And do me a favor, share this with at least one person. You never know who might need an uplifting message. If nobody's told you today, let me be the first. I love you and God does too.